Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. My name is Safir Ahmed and I'm the editor of Renovatio, uh, the journal of Zaytuna College. The core content of Renovatio is, consists of uh, theologians, scholars, writers, um, but we also supplement that, those articles and that content with interviews with the writers, like we're going to do one today, and with conversations between two scholars, and also at public events featuring one or more of the writers. Today we are honored to have with us Imam Zaid Shakir, whose article on the broad topic of Islam and nationalism is already posted on the Renovatio website. Imam Zaid wears multiple hats around here. He is an advisory board member of Renovatio. He is a co-founder of Zaytuna College. He teaches courses on Islamic history and politics and on contemporary Muslim thought. And now he's a writer for Renovatio as well. Uh, so welcome, Imam Zaid, and thank you for taking the time to sit with us today. Your article, if I can summarize it quickly, um, essentially seems to say that nationalism or nationalist thinking is sort of antithetical to Islam. That's a very short statement, but can you just expound on what the core message of your article is? What yeah, you first, let me start by saying wa alaykum as and thank well, you for so. inviting us uh, for this little chat. So I'll preface uh, any comments relating to nationalism or uh, national identity, nation state, by saying that Islam is not against the idea of national identity. Hmm. You find uh, throughout uh, in the Quran statements such as that we've made you into nations and tribes. So God says we've made you into nations and tribes, various people. And tribes, women, ayati, halqo samawatu lar, wachtilaf el sinek wa almanikum. Amongst his signs is the creation of the heavens and earth and the variation of your tongues and your colors. And so these various cultural differences and racial distinctions, if you will, there's something that are formed by the Quran. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the blessings and peace of Almighty. Al-Ghabi uh, so, upon him mentioned that uh, there are certain people, certain nations have certain, certain distinctions. Al-Adhan al-Habasha. The Adhan is for the Ethiopians. Al-Hikmatu Yamaniya. Wal-Imanu Yamani. The wisdom and faith are Yamani. Mm -hmm. And many the Persians, uh, the, uh, Allah God will bring another people if you turn back. Him and his people, and he placed his hand on the shoulder of Salman al Farisi. Mm -hmm. And so these differences and distinctions are firm. Nationalism involves an effort to use those differences and to use those distinctions as the basis of forming an effort to create a nation state that will work against the interest of other groups either within that uh, geographical area where that state is envisioned mm. or uh, in neighboring regions or areas. That's what Islam is against. It's against that potential source of conflict and strife between members of the human family. And as you point out in your article, the nation state itself is a recent phenomenon. It's a maybe two or three hundred, three hundred years ago or so, it's in the 17th century at, and afterwards. At one level, definitely, you could say uh, the nation state dates its birth to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, right. rather than the end of the Forty Years' War, and the right. dissolution of the whole Holy Roman Empire, and then the, the beginning of the formation of the secular territorial entities, mm -hmm. nation states, that are identified with particular people, but in terms of really taking its current form, it's uh, a 19th century development and phenomenon. Things like the unification of Germany in right, Prussia, that, under Prussia, for instance. The, the universalizing of the educational system in France, mm -hmm. uh, the various uh, states that grew up from European uh, colonial societies, Mm -hmm. So these are definitely late 19th century and 20th century developments. And it was essentially... Which means it's something new. It is something new, and it was, it's also European, as you said. 
is development focused on Western Europe and then export it to the rest of the world. Right, right. What do you think actually led up to that that trend, that movement of, of, of nationalism? I think one that we mentioned with the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire and then the so the eclipsing of the, the papal states and religiously identified states mm -hmm. uh, with the peace of Westphalia, with the emergence of a, a bourgeoisie vis-a-vis -vis the aristocracy and the aristocracy closely identified to greater or lesser extents with uh, uh, religious communities and this mm -hmm. bourgeoisie now taking its identity from its economic status and its economic power. So this is a secular elite that comes to begin to dominate these various territorial entities. And then the emergence of nationalist thinkers who see uh, a, a new basis for uh, a higher community, such as the Italian uh, Mazzini and uh, others. Mm -hmm. And I think those, those developments are some of the things that culminate in the creation of the nation state. And talk about what the damage or the negative side of nationalism and nation states is to you. I mean, in terms of both um, on a societal scale, but also on an individual level. The danger and the damage emerges from the fact that most uh, regions in this world are heterogeneous. They're not homogenous. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at India, there are 800 different languages, which means there are 800 different ethnic groups right. in India alone. And so what if each and every one of them develop a very strong nationalist movement? Uh, there will be bloodshed and chaos until the uh, unforeseeable future. And there has been some of that with and, the Tamils you saw. You can look and, at yeah. regions like France. We have Basque separatists, mm -hmm. uh, or, or Spain rather, Basque separatist movements. You can look at an entity like Great Britain, the United Kingdom, where there's with the strengthening of Welsh or Scottish nationalism you have forces pushing for the breakup of the United Kingdom. I think you've seen that played out in, in Ireland to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So this feeling of the need for an Irish state or maintaining a British-dominated state in Northern Ireland. Uh, and so I think the, the potential conflicts and the actual conflicts that arose with the consolidation of the nation state. We have two world wars. These were wars of conflicting nationalisms, by and large. Right. Uh, and many of the conflagrations that the uh, American uh, Civil War, while not being uh, totally nationalistic, in the sense that the southern states had a particular national identity that led them to secede from the Union. And the Union had a different identity, generally speaking, uh, that aided and abetted this bloody conflagration that occurred right here in the United States. So I think the, the danger is just if people and regions that are heterogeneous Various groups that see themselves as homogenous form a movement to create an independent state that sees itself as the outgrowth of their, this particular and, and unique identity. The, the potential for chaos and bloodshed and hatred uh, is just too great. And I think as weapons of mass destruction become ever more deadly. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't afford that as a human family. At the core of that, though, of that idea of, of creating a nation state, the desire for a sort of nationalist <clears throat> you know, uh, mindset and consciousness is either seems to me fear or insecurity or possibly just a superiority complex. Most theorists of... Uh, nationalism see the role that fear, anger, victimization play. You know, uh, real or perceived fears of some other mm -hmm. are ex exaggerated to create a heightened sense of different, difference. You know, those people that are threatening us, they're not like us. 
and the threat is rooted in their difference. And therefore, we should be upset and angry and mad at them uh, for casting us into this state of insecurity and fear. Being angry with them, we should lash out at them. And lashing out increasingly uh, is with ever more destructive weapons. And so this, this whole idea, and then the sense that uh, we're victims of their aggression, mm -hmm. we're victims of their transgression. Uh, we, we see in, in this country, uh, the average American is a victim of the immigrants who are taking our jobs, right. Right. pushing down uh, salaries and wages, are a victim of the, the threatening black male mm -hmm. who's always a menace there to kill us or rob us. And so we, we're afraid of them. And that fear translates into anger. And we're mad at them for threatening us in these ways. And that anger translates into a sense of victimization. Uh, you know, right now, there's an effort to uh, make us a victim, us meaning this country, a victim of the belligerence of North Korea. And in reality, North Korea has no strategic means to threaten this country. Right. But that fear leads, is, it can lead to an irrational anger. And that anger leads to a, a sense of victimization. And that victimization leading to a sense to separate us ourselves from them right. and to remove ourselves from them. And I think that's how those things play into the nationalist picture. You know, that reminds me of the idea of patriotism, though, when you talk about that, because there's a, and people go to war over, you know, people, there's a rise in patriotism when people, when a nation goes to war, for instance. But there's also another side of patriotism that seems to me is a good thing, which is love of the land, love of the beauty, love of the culture. You know, those are good things, right? Just as we can say as Muslims, national identity is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And because why? Life, we need meaning, and, and meaning is rooted in having something we can identify with, having something we can be proud of. We can be proud mm -hmm. of our language. We can be proud of our historical struggles right. that, that we've, uh, and our ability to survive and our ability to overcome. Those are good things, but they become bad things when they become the basis of elevating ourselves over others and mm -hmm. then from that position, harming them, harming them economically, harming them politically, harming them ecologically. You know, their land becomes the, death, the dumping ground for our toxins. Right. Uh, and so said the same thing with patriotism. There's nothing in Islam against patriotism in the Quran. I swear by this land, and you are a freeborn member of this, the community that this land defines. Mm -hmm. So that's in the Quran. Okay. And so loving the land, uh, historically, we've, Muslim people have always identified with their land, their country, their city. Al Khatib al Baghdadi, Khatib from Baghdad. Uh, Abu Talib al Mekki, mm -hmm. Abu Talib the Meccan. Right. Uh, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali at Dimashqi, Ibn Rajab, Ibn Rajab the Damascan Hanbalite. Right. So, this is, these things have been an integral part of being Muslim, an integral mm -hmm. part of the growth and spread of Islam in the world. But again, when that love is exploited to lead us to hate others and lead us to deny others the privilege of loving their land and lead us to take the resources, exploit the resources, and us here meaning any group vis-a-vis -vis another group. I'm not trying to imply there's some unique uh, American imperialism, and there are no other imperialistic <laughs> forces in the world besides America. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm just vis-a-vis -vis other people. Mm -hmm. That's when the patriotism becomes a bad thing. So patriotism as a source of identity, 
patriotism as a source of a rich life that gives us meaning. That's one thing. Patriotism as the foundation of a, of a move or movement to elevate ourselves and privilege ourselves vis-a-vis -vis others. And on the basis of that elevation, on the basis of, the, of that privileging to harm them and to disadvantage them and to usurp their resources, that's when patriotism becomes very bad and dangerous. And that's the kind of patriotism, if you will, that Islam argues against. And so <clears throat> I want to broaden it out a little bit uh, and both, uh, before we move into Islam and its teachings. But what you just said, for instance, uh, if you look at, you know, there's, a, there's this idea uh, quite prevalent today, I think, that historically speaking, most wars are religious or caused by religions. You know, people have this idea that especially before the 17th century, for instance, you know, you have the Crusades, you have all kinds of wars. Is that an accurate thing? Because there's also this idea um, that wars were just a cover for these. They were, they were you know, a, a veneer when really the, the real causes were ethnic or territorial or commercial right. or resource issues. What's your thinking about the idea of religions being, religion being a problem historically speaking. I, I think this is a, also a modern phenomenon that has accelerated with the spread of atheism, that we need to get rid of God and religion because religion is responsible for all the war, strife, and turmoil that we've experienced as a human family. I think that's a very superficial and fallacious argument. I think as you imply, if you look at the Crusades or you look at others, uh, wars or conflagrations that have been described as wars of religion, underneath that you will find the economic causes. You will find the uh, trying to accommodate uh, population uh, booms, overpopulation, uh, trying to uh, reconcile conflicting economic interests. You'll find that those are the real, and just plain human aggression and belligerence and uh, malevolence. Mm -hmm. Those are very real. I, I definitely, I, I don't believe that these are dominant human characteristics. In other words, they, they dominate the thinking, emotions, right. and actions of most human beings. I think most human beings are very altruistic, and most human beings are extremely inclined and predisposed towards peace and peaceful relations with each other. But you have some very belligerent, aggressive, male malevolent actors out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. historically, this combination of economic interest, of just basic human aggression and belligerence and uh, malevolence and just plain evil, uh, population expansions that require uh, more inputs mm -hmm. for the, a particular people or to export those populations to other lands to reduce the pressure, the economic pressures that uh, overpopulation creates in one area. I think these and other causes are the underlying causes of war, even during the time where religion was the domin dominant sociocultural force. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, when religion is the dominant sociocultural force, it's easy to say religion is the cause of all wars and violence. I think if you really want to get to the underlying causes, uh, look at the nature of war when there are other, other uh, forms of higher identity. What, what in the 20th century, mm -hmm. where most states are now nation states. How many wars was religion responsible for? Right. So someone might argue, okay, it's good, we got rid of religion, okay, but if religion's the cause of war, you didn't get rid of war. In fact, the 20th century had, uh, was the this, this century of the most people, both in real and percentage terms, dying as a result of war, two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, the wars of, of liberation, the anti-colonial wars. Collectively, more people died from war during this century where religion has been eclipsed and or vanquished altogether in many parts of the world as a viable social-political force. You have more wars than ever. 
And the mm-hmm. start of the 20th century is not lagging far behind. So to attribute war to religion, I think, is, is a very uh, fallacious argument and is an extremely inaccurate and fairly meaningless attribution. Uh, we need to look at the deeper causes. I want to ask you one other thing about Islam you said, and I was really intrigued by this um, statement you made in your, in your uh, article. And I want to read that statement to you real quickly and, and get your thoughts on it, have you expound on that a little bit. What you said was this, a short sentence. Islam provides a set of beliefs and principles that simultaneously foster cultural distinction and universalism. Now, that almost sounds paradoxical. I Explain think, that I think me. that is the basic paradox that the nation state has been un- unable uh, to resolve or solve. Uh, you see multiculturalism clashing with uh, narrow nationalist interests. Mm-hmm. And as we said, the nation state is a, a European development in terms of its origin. Even the colonial states uh, or European settler states, the United States, Australia, Canada. These states, uh, the states that arose in Latin America in the aftermath of the Bolivarian Revolution, these were states dominated by white elites. Mm -hmm. And the state has been unable to reconcile the domination of white elites, uh, uh, elites rather, with the emerging demands of other other groups mm-hmm. within the states. Mm-hmm. Here in the United States, there are three foundational uh, national communities, if you will. In other words, communities that were present in large numbers at the time the state was founded. Right. The Europeans, uh, settlers and colonizers, and they were European colonies, the British colonies mm-hmm. at the time of independence. So some people might get upset by saying the European settlers or colonizers, <clears throat> the native or indigenous people. Right. And most of the illegal immigrants from Mexico and Central America are descendants of those peoples. Right. And then the African slaves and contemporarily the descendants of African slaves. You have three, group, three groups, but well, one group wants to, and especially now with the resurgence of white nationalism and a white nationalist regime in the White House, the White House, <laughs> want, <laughs> wants to, to dominate mm-hmm. and uh, use the state to benefit their group to the exclusion of the others. And you can look at Europe, the same thing is happening and to a lesser extent along different lines and states throughout the world. So how do we accommodate the uh, universality and the demands for a universal equal uh, playing field Mm -hmm. for everyone and the particular interests of these conflicting groups? My argument is that Islam was able to do that, particularly uh, during the uh, late, 13th Miladi or Common Era and much of the 14th century where you had a, an integrated realm mm-hmm. economically that stretched from Scandinavia to the British Isles, to the Mediterranean, all of those Christian states and the, the Italian, what would become the Italian, uh, the, or what were the Italian city-states so, of Venice and Rome and the Papal State and uh, Florence and others, the Muslim-dominated realm that stretched across Central Asia, West Asia, Central Asia, uh, outwards towards China, and then the Mongol-dominated Yuan dynasty in China. And throughout that realm, Islam had a, a very prominent role in creating, especially in the Muslim regions, a universal political culture Hmm. that facilitated this realm being integrated at at an economic level, stable politically, generally speaking, on the one hand, but recognizing and accommodating all the disparate 
religious, racial, ethnic, mm -hmm. tribal groups that were encompassed in that realm. And Islam was key to that. Uh, now, someone might uh, argue that, well, why then did Islam accept the nation state? I think the nation state was a, a post-colonial phenomenon that was imposed on most Muslim states. And even though the elites dominating the state and benefiting in some instances exclusively from the states, from the creation of the, the nation state, if you will, because the, these states are very uh, weak in mm -hmm, terms of mm -hmm. being homogenous nation states. Uh, but the groups dominating, be they rooted in a political uh, identity, such as the Ba'ath states, formerly right. Iraq, contemporarily Syria, formerly Syria and Iraq, be they uh, rooted in a tribal identity group that dominates the state, they might accept this difference because in each instance, they, these various, this particular political party, this particular tribal group, this particular uh, ethnic group within the state benefits disproportionately. Therefore, they see the state as being legitimate and uh, a good thing. But beneath that level, at the level of the masses of the people, I think you'll find a very strong trans nation state umma consciousness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's sometimes exploited like just as nationalists exploit certain cultural features and uh, elements of cultural identity in very nefarious ways that sort of umma consciousness can similarly and has been and is being exploited in some instances in very nefarious counterproductive ways yeah i um Here's a little different question. I think the, in, when you talk about Islam, I want to say <clears throat> first that you know, and if you look at the Western tradition, there's a very strong Western tradition regarding politics and political philosophy that goes back to you know, Plato and Plato's Republic and Aristotle's politics. Um, and a lot of work has been done on that since then. Um, do you think that Islam, the Islamic tradition, has the resources to sort of articulate a political uh, philosophy for the modern world that can actually transcend the nationalism you're talking about? Uh, I, I think, I believe so, uh, that most definitely. And again, this is a long-term project. We're not talking about the nation state disappearing tomorrow right, and this right. sort of uh, beautiful, triumphal, Islamic unity. <laughs> right providing the foundation for global harmony and peace. We're talking, looking at Islam as the incubator mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a different set of ideas that has uh, allowed for this paradox to be uh, solved mm -hmm. in certain times and places as the incubator for ideas that can help us move beyond the nation state and its inherent dangers and to solve that paradox of universalism vis uh, uh, particularism, mm -hmm. these particular identities. And so I think that Islam can definitely do that. It's something that will require a lot of work and it's something that will require uh, many Muslims understanding the potential that our religion has in this regard, because I think a lot of Muslims are trapped in uh, very, very deeply ensconced in nationalist thinking. That's what's going to be my next question. I think that there is, um, there are a lot of Muslims today, as you know, who are, I, I would, my assumption would be that they're sort of unaware of the very tradition you're talking about, the teachings of Islam that go against nationalism. And those are people who are also sort of lured or seduced by very nationalist, short-term almost thinking in that sense. Um, is that something that needs to more people, more Muslims like yourself, need to sort of you know, articulate and speak out about so it's sort of begin to... what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because you see amongst many Muslims, even today you hear a lot of talk, uh, a lot of Muslims condemning, even uh, non-white Muslims condemning white Muslims for enjoying white privilege. And so you hear this sort of uh, words and then generating a lot of uh, fear, insecurity, distrust mm 
-hmm. And then anger, if you look at the vitriolic uh, nature of the way a lot of that discourse unfolds. Right. And these are the things Islam argues against. Don't use fear mm -hmm. of the other. Don't use anger directed towards that other that you fear. Don't use a sense of victimization vis-a-vis -vis that other to become the basis of separating yourself from that other and trying to create a unique uh, political, social, cultural realm that excludes that other. Th these are things Islam argues, as I've tried to show in the article, very strongly against. Rather, go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recognize that other as an other. And Islam tells us, Islamic teachings instruct us to do that, but also recognize that other as someone you have to cooperate with for the greater good of our societies, the greater good of our, our children, the greater girl, go, good in a nuclear world in which nuclear weapons are proliferating, becoming smaller and smaller, and hence more dangerous and more difficult to control. Right. Don't use that hatred, that fear, that anger towards the other, that sense of being victimized of the, uh, by the other to create a movement where you might attempt to annihilate that other. And we have the means to do that, unfortunately. And so that being the case, I think it's extremely important that we cultivate the means to peacefully and productively coexist. And, that and has I think been, Islam has done that historically. Right. That's not, what I was going to say. Not in They're, all times and places, but certainly in certain times and places over vast expanses of territory. And that has been the tradition. That has been the history of Islam in many ways. The idea of coexisting and not having this idea of superiority, <clears throat> and certainly not to the, to the disadvantage of, of other people. By and large. And so I think my last question before we wrap up would be, you know, um, do you see signs of sort of an alternative to nationalism or that kind of thinking that are already, do you see hopeful signs when you look around today when, within Islam, but, but perhaps outside as well? Absolutely. I think the, the sort of uh, transnationalist thinking in terms of creating larger unifying political entities and manifested itself in the creation of the European Union. Certainly that union is threatened by the resurgence of nationalist right. thinking in, in many of the countries that comprise that union. But I think that, that was a great advance. You see it in uh, uh, international cooperation mm -hmm. and creation of international institutions, international finance, financial institutions that have transcended the nation state in terms of their operation, both in, in scale and in terms of transcending that, the control of, any, of a particular nation state. Now, one could argue that that sort of uh, global or multinational corporation uses that transcendence in, in very negative ways. You could argue that, but the mere fact that we have created institutions and entities that have transcended the nation state provides the hope of creating institutions that can facilitate a, a transnational interactions and transnational uh, behavior that's beneficial mm -hmm. to humanity as much as the recklessness of some transnational corporations is detriment, detrimental to humanity contemporarily. And then there's much good that comes from, from others. It's not an all bad uh, scenario here. I think also the uh, idea of humanitarian intervention. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. the idea that the interest of humanity at large transcend the interest of the nation state. Right. And this right. idea of national interest is an integral part of both nationalist thinking and an integral part of how nation states have conducted themselves in terms of their policies vis-a-vis -vis other communities. So the idea that you can transcend and go beyond the state or ignore the state in the interest of protecting or saving or preserving the lives and the integrity of the, the community of various groups within the nation state, again, is a development that leads us to begin to look beyond the nation state in terms of those 
universal mm -hmm. developments, institutions, entities that allow us to come together in cooperative ways. And again, someone could argue, I would argue, that humanitarian intervention has been misused. I think the situation in Libya, which is now a mess and right, a menace, right. it started in humanitarian yeah. intervention. We have to intervene in Libya on behalf of the Libyan people to save an, an impending, looming massacre in Benghazi. Right, right. And so the American and French used that justification of humanitarian intervention right. to pursue their policies. That was a misuse of the, the Yeah, the exactly. And, and yeah. so I'm just acknowledging that right. when I point to these things as the potential foundations of the institutional basis mm -hmm the organizational basis to begin transcending the nation state. I'm not arguing that it's all good right. or there's not a lot of work that we need to do to really uh, maximize the potential impact of those organizations or those institutions or those ideas. But they do provide the foundation in real terms that we right. can look to practically to begin to envision moving beyond the nation state. Uh, the bottom line, I think, is absolutely imperative that we began to move beyond the nation state simply because most regions on this earth, especially now with the mobility of the human race, with the looming uh, mobility or the uh, looming movement of people's vast amount of people due to climate change, right, right. you're going to have more, more heter heterogeneous uh, regions in this world. And if all of those people develop nationalist movements with the mixing of people that you see, there will be total right. chaos, chaos, confusion, yeah. and bloodshed into the unforeseeable future. And I think as a human family, we can do better than that. And I think as a Muslim in studying and looking at Islamic teachings, that Islam can help to provide the foundation to actually do better and to actually begin moving beyond the nation state and to reconcile that and to solve that paradox of the universal particular uh, struggle mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. unfolding in so many state, uh, uh, states today on, on the face of this earth. And the, for the Muslims who are not the Muslim leadership, but the Muslim ummah, so to speak, what advice would you have regarding these issues? I would say as, as Muslims, we have to realize the great, great potential contribution we can make to a safer and saner world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the great uh, historian, Arnold Toynbee, he mentioned two things Islam can contribute positively to Western societies, solving the persistent race issue based mm -hmm. on his observation of the religion and the problem of intoxicants. Mm -hmm. As you see, our country is being ravaged by the opioid right. Right. Uh, epidemic sweeping across rural and suburban areas, already uh, a problem in many urban areas. Intoxicants are huge, and add to that the issue of the alcoholism and the dangers and loss of lives and highway accidents and domestic violence that's associated with alcoholism. That is not an insignificant contribution. But I think many Muslims don't realize uh, the foundation of Toynbee's statement. What mm. did he see in Islam, studying it as a an well-educated and intelligent outsider? Right. I think what he saw, many Muslims don't see. And so I think it behooves uh, Muslims to step back, take a deeper look at our religion, and to realize there are a whole lot of positive contributions we can make to modern society, but for those to be really credible and to gain the attention of the world, we have to first apply those to ourselves so that we have models in our societies of what the rest of the world could look like. On that note, um, we have reached the end of the program. I want to urge everyone to uh, please take some time to read Imam Zaid's um, article on Islam and nationalism. And I want to thank Imam Zaid for taking time to share your thoughts and your wisdom with Honor us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Safir Ahmed. Please join us again for some more enlightening conversations with our writers at Renavasio. Thank you. <laughs>